A little more rapid fire today. We're going to focus on 10 reasons to not let game math keep you out of game programming. Reason number one is it's extremely directly practical. You're always doing something with it. You are learning it for the reason of applying it to solve a very specific problem. So a lot of what holds people back, even just conceptually or mentally or psychologically about math, is this hang up of when am I going to use this? Every time you're dealing with math for game programming, you're learning it because you are right then and there using it to get a power up or make a car spin better or make particle effects do something more interesting. There's always a reason, and you are aware of that reason because that's why you're learning that math at that point. Reason number two is that game math is very often the same narrow subset of math used over and over and over again. So some of it involves words that can seem intimidating if you're new to using math for game programming. Stuff like sine and cosine, stuff like vectors and normalizing, but the reality is those same four words come up a lot. You start to see these major patterns between, gosh, every time a certain kind of thing happens where I need angles involved, I'm going to be using certain functions. Whenever I have something going on that's going to involve distances and directions, certain kind of functions are going to be needed. Whenever there are, you know, different situations that come up in 3D with rotations and so on. And this pattern becomes easier to see because it's really the same several pieces of math used over and over and over again. So even though there's definitely intersection to what was done in trigonometry class or geometry class or matrices or some other class, most of what you do in those classes where you're solving for X and you're computing things by hand, etc., don't really apply to what we're using it for. And a lot of people, they either feel like, well, I forgot it, whatever I knew in high school, or I didn't really even get it the first time. To be honest, they're not at any more of a disadvantage than people who actually remember and were pretty good at it in high school because a lot of it's a very different use than what we did with it in other types of applications outside of game programming. Speaking of solving it step by step, reason number three is that you are basically never solving or doing any of the math. A lot of the monotony, a lot of the attention to detail that frustrates us or annoys people's experience with it is they're carrying digits and they dropped one thing, one place, or they added two numbers wrong or whatever. And here's the thing, right? Computer is really, really, really good at adding numbers, multiplying numbers, doing anything you can picture with numbers. It's just going to absolutely destroy you at it. So it's not as if you are ever actually having to add numbers, multiply numbers, calculate sine or cosine, do matrix multiplication, handle quaternions by hand. All you need to do as a game programmer is identify the situations where this is a situation where addition, multiplication, sine, cosine, vector stuff, etc. is appropriate. And once you see that that's the situation where you need that set of functions that are called attached to quaternions, you don't have to be able to solve what's going on with all those numbers. You just have to identify here's where it applies. The computer takes care of the long winded, difficult, boring part where you sometimes dropped a digit or mixed up what order to do things in. You don't have to sweat any of that. The computer is doing it when you're using math for game programming. Reason number four is that the math is usually simpler because it's one step in one part at a time. A lot of what makes more advanced math more advanced is it's trying to kind of in certain ways predict the future very precisely about a variety of factors that change over time. And so we picture like air resistance or friction and other kinds of stuff that causes physics math to involve calculus. A lot of what makes that not a problem in game programming is that most math and game programming really amounts to a lot of arithmetic, piles and piles of arithmetic, where every single piece of code you're writing is what happens in this instant to the car, to the player, to the rocket. Once you figure out how to make that happen per instant, well, there's actually an emergent effect in your game, just like there is in physical reality, of how far does it take for a car to stop if it's going full speed and you slam on the brakes and it skids. Well, that's a tricky problem to solve precisely in reality. And in games, you don't actually have to solve that problem. What you have to solve is, how do I make this car that's going fast go slower? And if you can figure out what that line of code looks like, you call it every single frame, you test it out in your game, you feel out, how far did my car skid when I hit the brakes? And if it's not as far or farther than you wanted it to be, you tweak that number and you try it again. Point number five relates to that, and that's that variables involved are never abstract. One of the things that makes programming so different is that when you have variables, those variables have values, always. You're not even to reason about for all possible values of K or M or L or N or X or Y or Z. Instead, any given moment in time, there is a velocity. There is a position. There is all this data. But it means that for any given situation, you're constantly testing concrete cases. And so rather than trying to reason your way through, well, is this going to work for every single possible angle? You can quite often write your code to do what looks like. Well, it seems like from what I've done before, something like this might apply connect a position to your mouse position, move it in a circle around it and check and see does it do what it's supposed to do from different angles. 
And this ability to just observe the effect makes it much easier to work with than the abstractions of trying to picture all possible values of any given moment you're testing very specific values of, and that makes it a lot easier and more tangible and concrete to work with when you're using math for game programming. Leads directly to point six, which is that you can instantly check your work because it's very often spatial and visual. And if it's something where it's not spatial or visual, you can actually use the same game programming techniques that draw lines on the screen, shapes, position objects, to take a problem that seemed abstract and turn it into a visual spatial one. Quite often you're dealing with looking at how far apart are these objects? Which one is left of the other? What are the angles between them? Was this one pointing at that one? And this allows you to immediately check your work. I mean, even a layer behind that, right? Sometimes when you're writing code, you might write code and get some typos in there or write something that's kind of not the right formatting or syntax instantly without having to try to schedule an appointment with your TA, without having to try to meet with your professor, without having to worry about wasting someone else's time who knows it better, you can push a button on the computer, either compile or play if you're in a modern engine, and it'll just tell you immediately, hey, uh, yeah, you wrote something invalid on line 121. Go back and revisit that. You poke and you pull at that until you find a way to let it run the code, and once it can run the code, it shows you what that code currently does. That gives you a chance to then check, is this the behavior that I want? Is it doing the thing that I expect it to do? And instead of not finding out until you get your paper back with red marks on it and then feel bad because, well, I didn't know it and I, you know, I should have known it. I wasn't sure if I was right. I couldn't tell. You can immediately tell if what you've done has solved it yet. And if it's not, well, you chip away at it some more. Number seven is that the goal is simply to get it working. You chip away at it until it works and then you move on to the next thing. And if you've ever taken a test or especially like a take home project where it was specifically open book, open internet, ability to ask others about it who've done it before and see what they've discussed and how they've solved it, you know that those can be a little bit less intimidating and basically every situation using math and game programming outside of some intimidating interview where they're trying to figure out can you chalkboard a vector equation if you've, you know, the power goes out. That's a discussion for another day. Most of what you're doing with math and game programming is essentially open book, open internet, open dialogue. You can search other people who've solved this problem before, how they've discussed it. And there's a lot of common patterns that come up in game programming where it's pretty unlikely in most cases that you are the first person to run into this problem. You can find other people have talked about it, linked to resources, solved it. Sometimes there's a whole function built in that kind of does a lot of the question you're up against because so many people ran into this before. And the only thing that matters is that you got it working, right? It's okay if you came about a slightly different angle. It's okay if you did it a slightly different way. If it works, it works. You move on to the next thing. An example I love for this, by the way, too, is MC Escher you know, famous illustrator of cool optical illusions and stuff from back in the day, when he'd be doing weird lens distortions and twists and twirls and all these interesting deformations of his images, people sometimes would think that he was a genius and that he just understood crystallography or is like somehow really an expert in these mathematical topics. And he said in one of his old lectures that he specifically would learn just enough for how to do a specific piece he's working on and then it would pretty quickly leave his mind. And for the next project, he'd then figure out what I need to learn for this one. This sort of thing happens all the time in game programming where you're learning just enough to solve a very particular problem you're running up against, and you're not sure if it's going to be years or sometimes months before you hit that problem again. If you see it repeatedly, you can refer back to your previous solutions, because again, it's all open book. Or if, you know, doesn't take a few years, then you'll learn it again when you need to. But you don't have to just worry about, have I mastered this to do it forever? It's, can I get it working? And if so, I'm ready to move on. Point eight is that the reward is typically something that we care about. We wanted it to do the thing. We wanted a certain effect, a certain behavior, a thing to exist that doesn't, to work that didn't, and now it does. Now, you know, a lot of rewards in life are symbolic. It's trophies and medals and getting first in a contest, or even in some ways, grades are really kind of abstract in the same kind of way. And like grades, sort of like with money, they're beneficial and they're practical. I don't mean to, you know, say anything about those, but they're not intrinsic, right? They're not something where... You just wanted to do the thing. If you did, they might not have had needed to pay you for it. That's often a measure of what someone else wanted done, not necessarily what we wanted done or how. When you are programming games, and of course my focus is often freeware, stuff that we're making on our own because it's fun to make and I want this thing to exist, it's just such a different reward when I needed my character to do something and now it does. I wanted my vehicles to behave a certain way, and now they do. I wanted my AI to do a certain thing or to not do a certain thing, and now I've fixed it and solved it. And that reward, chasing that satisfaction of something didn't exist or didn't work and now it does because I wanted it to and I found a way to make it do it, chasing that reward is a lot of what keeps game programmers game programming in a lot of cases because it's a lot of fun and it feels really good to overcome that challenge of I can just solve how to make it do the things I needed to do. Point nine is that approximate is often good enough in game programming. In fact, in some cases, it's even better. 
right? So this is something where in conventional math situations, there's often a precisely correct answer and then every other answer is kind of wrong, not even shades of gray, it's just wrong. Or you might even get the right answer, but if you go about it the wrong way, well, again, wrong because the important part is often the process. And there's a reason why that's gotta be the way if you're getting a PhD in math. But if what you're doing is programming a game and not, for example, a full simulation for sake of a crass test simulator used by the auto industry or something, in many cases, you can hand wave away a lot of stuff, right? Think about how actual bullets work for ballistic trajectories with guns. There's air resistance, there's gyroscopic dynamics, there's wind, there's gravity drop. There's a lot of complexity. Now, unless you're literally making a gun simulator for some sort of company, or again, I guess certain hunting games involve a bit of complexity, for many types of games, what many players want in many genres acts more like a laser cannon. It pretty much hits the target. It's a straight line. It you know, deviates maybe by a slight randomized parameter, but it's much simpler to actually achieve more of what they want. Many years ago, my first summer in Los Angeles, I met a couple of stunt actors who were practicing on the beach, sword fighting with wooden sticks. They were pretty impressive at it, but they weren't very good at it. And I was not a great fencer, but I'd done enough fencing to be like, wow, this is pretty wild. Tell me about what you're doing here. And they explained, yeah, this is actually terrible technique for self-defense or terrible technique for winning an Olympics or something but it looks great on film when the cameras are all swishing around and swooping and that this is what they'll get paid to do. And very often in games, what players want to have happen is closer to how Hollywood depicts things. The way characters should jump, the way weapons behave, the way vehicles move is actually many times simpler and totally out of touch with reality. But the point is to make something fun and engaging and speaks to their imaginations and matches their expectations of authenticity as opposed to accuracy. And that's the sort of thing that comes from the fact that approximate in games is often good enough the easier solution may be more of what the player actually wants. And because it can be approximate, if the direct way you were originally going about it doesn't seem to work out, there's often several other options that are close enough to get away with. And there's so many other ways we can solve these problems that again might be easier, look the same to the player, the player didn't care, and as the developer, keeps our stress level low, frees our energy to spend it on other more interesting problems and adding more features to our games. Reason 10 why game math is much different and in some ways better than other kinds of uses of math is that there's no materials at risk, so you can try again as much as you need to. Now, this one sounds like a bizarre one if you're used to making software, if you're coming from mostly a digital world of, of course this is the case, but it's so key to not take for granted. There's a lot of ways to apply mathematics, right? If you were doing physics or biology or chemistry or architecture, there's a lot of ways to apply math. Now, the downside of applying math in those fields is that if you get it wrong, if you just try a theory and it doesn't work the way you expect it to, you're probably out some cash and some time and some inconvenience from having to restart your petri dish, rebuild your bridge, lab chemicals. Like, okay, if my rocket doesn't do what I wanted it to do, I've got to buy or build another rocket, especially if the one I had exploded. When what you're working with is software, not only can you test it as many times as you need to test it, you can often contrive situations to push a button and reproduce with 100% precision every time, same start position, same angle, same relative orientation of everything, capture the state of everything, restart it, capture the state when something crashes, what happened just beforehand, and reproduce that scenario. And this ability is just so nice to be able to, again, attack a problem and just push at the problem. It's not a quiz of, you know, do I know how it works? Can I solve it off my head? It's, hey, I can create the situation I need to fix. I can try some stuff and check and see if it fixed it. And this makes it just so grounded, so concrete. And the fact that we never have to worry about, I ran out of wood, my thing fell apart, I got to start over, my bacteria are gone. None of that stuff is a problem in game programming. And it's a small thing we take for granted, but it really makes a huge difference in why we can just attack these problems until they're solved and overcome. So this discussion, they have 10 reasons why doing math for game programming is nothing to be intimidated by is actually a sneak peek of some later material that I'm working on for my gamedevtraining.com free weekly email course. Now, I say email course because it's not just an email list where I'm like sending an email once a week. What happens is when you join that list, you get email one. A week later, you get email two. It's not like you missed all the past materials. This is important to me because I, as a teacher, like to be able to build on past concepts. So when I write these, I know what you've already read. But I'm dozens of emails into that series. I've been just been sharing tips and techniques we found work for private training clients of mine, people I've worked with over the years, building video games, often in situations just like yours of starting out or maybe built some things, done some jams or made some solar projects or just kind of hitting some walls. And just like today's discussion, right, it's not like I was talking about where to put semicolons or how to use if statements. It's a little more conceptual level, so it's much more general in a way that applies to a lot of people's paths through game development. So if you want to join that list, I encourage you to check out gamedevtraining.com and join today.